the floating Earth. The biggest discovery in the pre scientific era. We start our first episode with the following question What is the biggest scientific discovery in history? The answer? Obviously, this is a somewhat silly question and a silly answer. But I think it is the fact that the Earth is floating in space. This seems so obvious and trivial now, and people take it for granted. But stop for a second and think about it. If you are a caveman, then this is a preposterous statement. A complete nonsense. We are all floating in space. How? Why? Everything else seems not so radical compared to this. You may think relativity is strange. Quantum mechanics is spooky. But try to explain the fact that we are floating in space. How weird is that? You may or may not agree with this, but the point is physics is about wonder. Today's question. In fact, this was the first major progress in our understanding of the universe, literally the first in tens of thousands of years. We will start each lesson with a question or two. Today's question is, how did people come to realize that the Earth was floating in space? This is the theme of today's story. For the first few stories of this series including this one, we will also address the following more broad question, how did philosophy begin? Science and physics in particular, was born from philosophy. As a matter of fact, the primary focus of the early Greek philosophers was understanding our cosmos. Hence, we can say that the first branch of philosophy was cosmology. By the way, we are pro-philosophy if you will which makes us a minority in the mainstream physics community. Today's story. Today, we will primarily focus on the birth of Western philosophy while going over some of the ancient cosmological models. In particular, we will start from the oldest model of the universe that our ancestors likely had. Then we will go through the evolution of Greek philosophers' worldview, from the discovery that the Earth is floating in space and eventually it rotates around the sun roughly once a year. Note that this progress took over 2,000 years. All of us should be familiar with these concepts at this point. And they are all Galilean levels, as indicated by G. A Brief History of Scientific Discoveries So, a journey of a hundred lessons starts from the first step. We will go over some notable scientific discoveries in the beginning of Western civilization in the first few stories, in terms of our understanding of nature. Today, we start with the story of our incredible discovery that the Earth was floating, spinning, and rotating around the Sun all at once. Questions and not answers You might ask, why do we start the physics lessons from philosophy? Is ancient philosophy still relevant? Yes, I believe so. Many of the questions that puzzled Greek philosophers are still unanswered, and they remain relevant to this day. Note that we only raise questions. We just tell stories in this series. Anything we say here, you should take it with a healthy skepticism. We are anti-dogmatic, and you should be too. Ultimately, it is up to you whether you find any of these questions interesting or whether you find any of our stories credible. Chapter 3. First, the big picture of the scientific history. Philosophy and the history of philosophy is not something that they routinely teach to physics majors in college these days. For viewers who are not generally familiar with the history of science and that of philosophy, let's quickly take a look at the overall timeline of scientific progress from the 30,000 feet above. Two Ongoing Revolutions In history, there were two important events that marked critical progress in our approach to understanding nature. The Philosophical Revolution, that started roughly two and a half millennia ago, in ancient Greece. The Scientific Revolution, that started some half a millennia ago, at the time of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, among others. As for the name, the Philosophical Revolution, this is a made-up name. We refer by this designation 
to the period when the Western philosophy was born, in particular, in the Ionian region of ancient Greece. Ancient, philosophical, and scientific periods. Hence, we can divide the past 10 or 20 millennia into three periods, ancient, philosophical, and scientific periods. The ancient pre-philosophical period. The pre-scientific, philosophical period, for about 2,000 years. The modern scientific era, for the most recent past 500 years or so, since the time of Copernicus and Galileo. As for the scientific period, unlike social and political revolutions, which generally mark a brief period in history, we are living through the ongoing scientific revolution. It is currently, and it will likely always be, in progress. Chapter 4. The Ancient World. Let's start with the ancient period. This was the prehistoric and pre-philosophical period in which mythology, superstition and supernatural thinking dominated for tens of thousands of years. Incidentally, the most important event in human history was likely to be the invention of language, roughly one or two hundred thousand years ago. The Ancient View of the World To set a baseline for the scientific progress in the subsequent years and centuries, let's try and imagine what it would have been like in the ancient times before the beginning of the philosophical and scientific revolutions. In some sense, many people may consider what we are going to talk about trivial. But as we will see, there are still profound questions that are to be answered. First of all, for our ancestors, for hundreds of thousands of years, the entire world must have consisted of just heaven and earth. The ancient universe. This is probably the oldest cosmological model. The ancient world comprises three essential elements, from bottom up. Flat earth at the bottom. The absolute sense of up and down, and heaven above. This is the world which a newborn baby sees and learns. In fact, this is indeed the world that we all live in. Terra firma. If you think about it, it is obvious. We are standing on the firm and solid ground, which is, for all intents and purposes, infinitely heavy, infinitely large, immovable, and permanently present. Hence, the solid earth was most likely the integral component of our ancestors' view of the world. The ground earth was flat and immovable. The ground was finite in size, and it had boundaries far away in all directions, since the heavenly bodies rise from the east and set to the west. The ground stretched infinitely downward. That is, nonsensical questions like what was below the earth would have never occurred to the ancient people. Just imagine for a minute that how much comfort this knowledge gave our ancestors, that is, the fact that we were standing and living on a firm and stable ground, which exist permanently. How could you think of any other possibilities? Up and down, built into our brains? Next, let's consider our sense of up and down. We have this absolute sense of the vertical directions, up and down, which is probably built into our biology. This is likely due to the fact that we have evolved on the surface of the Earth, which is an enormous and hugely massive object compared to our own weights. In fact, even animals must have a clear sense of up and down. For example, we see dogs and cats jump up and down and birds fly, and we have no doubt that they also know the vertical up and down, or high and low. This probably applies to every living being, including even insects and plants. In any case, does this mean that up and down is absolute? Heaven and Earth Now let's take a look at the third component, heaven. Heaven was likely to be considered the opposite of the Earth. Heaven was pure. And most importantly, heaven was something which you could see, but which was not reachable. Therefore, things like air and cloud were considered part of the earth, and not heaven. Ancient people likely considered heaven to have a hemispherical shape that covers the earth. By the time of Pythagoras, heaven was considered a complete spherical shape, but we are getting a bit ahead ourselves here. The flat earth plus heaven above was most likely the standard model of our world, if you will, before the beginning of the philosophical revolution, 
across different civilizations. And people lived between these two, heaven on top and the flat and immovable earth at the bottom. In addition, people likely observed the heavenly bodies, and they possessed a fair amount of simple astronomical knowledge, even before the philosophical revolution. Some nutty questions. Do you think there are animals other than us who know or recognize the difference between the earth and heaven? Do you think people at the time believed that the heaven was infinitely extended? Do you think the ancient people considered the earth to be at the center of the universe? Everything falls. Although it's a pure speculation, we can safely assume that even the ancient people had some basic knowledge of physics. For example, probably everybody knew that things fall to the ground if they are left alone. An object in an up, higher state has a tendency to fall to a down, lower state. Again, this intuition has probably been ingrained deep into our brains, to us earthlings, through evolution, and it is not something that we have to learn. Aristotle, for example, formulated his theory of physics partly based on such everyday experience of ours. The Paradox of Heavenly Bodies But heavenly bodies do not fall. The sun does not fall. The moon does not fall. None of the stars fall. Why do they not fall to the earth? Of course we all know the answer now, but let's play along for now. By the way, many people appear to believe that why is not a scientific question. However in English, why sometimes means how or in what way. So, this question, for example, can be interpreted as How do we explain the fact that the heavenly bodies do not fall to the earth? However, for us nutty physicists, why is a much more fundamental question. And we will always ask why. Round Heaven One of the great inventions of Greek philosophers, astronomers, was the concept of heavenly spheres, also known as celestial spheres. The idea was that the heaven was a shell of a spherical or hemispherical shape, presumably, with a firm and stiff structure. Then all heavenly bodies like the sun and stars were attached on that heavenly sphere. And hence they do not fall. This idea is, more or less, credited to Thales of Miletus. Thales is now considered the first philosopher, the first astronomer, and the first mathematician in Western civilization. Later philosophers such as Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudoxus, and Aristotle, as well as Ptolemy in the second century, among many other Greek philosophers, advocated and improved this concept, and it remained an integral part of our view of the universe for over a thousand years. Incidentally, the Pythagoreans, Pythagoras and his followers, and later Greek philosophers believed that the circle and the sphere was a perfect shape. This idea also seemed to have originated from Thales, as we will see in the next few stories. The Center of the Universe? We are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but let's briefly talk about the concept of the center of the universe. Where did it come from? We can only speculate, but it shouldn't be hard to imagine that people must have taken it for granted that the Earth was at the center of the universe for tens of thousands of years. It wasn't probably even a question that anybody bothered to ask, how else could it have been? Now that the Greek philosophers started to realize, or more like postulated, that the heaven was a spherical shell, it dovetailed well with the idea that the Earth, and hence all of us, were at the center of this spherical universe. The Snow Globe Universe So, here's a schematic drawing of the ancient worldview around the time of the beginning of Western philosophy. By the time of Thales, they likely had this image of the world, which is more or less like a snow globe. The flat Earth at the center of the universe heavenly sphere with fixed stars and the absolute direction of up and down. And the ancient people lived inside this snow globe. It is almost reminiscent of the movie, The Truman Show. One thing to note is that, although it is a very simple model, it more or less reflects our native view of the world, even to this day. And, the simplicity does not seem to come from the fact that the model is simple. It really appears as if we live in a truly simple world. Chapter 5 
the comprehensible universe mystery. Let's take a quick digression and think about the following somewhat philosophical question. Why does the universe that we live in appear rather simple? The world is so simple. The biggest mystery of our universe is that it is simple, or maybe simple enough. Strangely, nature appears to have followed Einstein's advice that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Our universe and the laws that govern the universe appear to be rather simple, but not too simple. Why? You may or may not agree with Einstein, but the biggest mystery of our universe seems to be that it is not that mysterious, after all. Incidentally, this particular view of Einstein, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible, was an influence of Immanuel Kant. The sunrise and sunset. This is a true mystery. Just think about the fact that we are living in an infinitely simpler universe, considering that there could possibly be an infinite number of a lot more complicated universes, which are at least conceivable. This likely encouraged early philosophers to attempt to understand nature, since the world did not appear completely arbitrary and capricious. So why is our universe rather simple but not as simple, and not too simple to be boring? The Sunrise Paradox This particular paradox of sunrise and sunset puzzled the early natural philosophers. In the ancient worldview of the flat earth, in which the ground occupied the whole bottom. How does it do that? Of course, it applies to other heavenly bodies, and not just to the sun. First of all, we can ask, is it the same sun every day? The answer is obvious today, but why would that be to the people who does not know the theory of modern solar system? If it's the same sun, then the sun has to move from the location in the west to somewhere in the east during the night, every night. How exactly does the sun do that? For this particular question, obviously, we all know the answer. But for our ancestors with the ancient view of the cosmos, i.e., the heaven and the bedrock earth model, it should have been a complete mystery.